Psalm 146. Praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. And so let us heed the psalmist's call to worship with our opening hymn, number 108, Come Christians, Join to Sing. Father, we thank you for the invitation you give to us to come and to lift up your name in praise and adoration. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity to gather here this morning. And as we come to worship you, Father, we pray that by your Holy Spirit, you would prepare our hearts and our minds so that not only as we sing, but also as we listen, as we fellowship, as we share together, Lord, through all of that, that you will be reminding us of your promises, of what you have done for us. And then, Father, in return, we offer to you our gratitude and our praise. So, Father, we ask for your blessing upon this time, and uh, we give you thanks for it. We pray this all in Jesus' name. I invite you to greet one another this morning. Father, again, we come to the beginning of a new week, and as we do that, we reflect back over this past week, and uh, we count our blessings. It's been a good week, weather-wise, and we thank you for that, and Father, we thank you for your provision through each and every day. Father, we thank you for 
just so many ways. Lord, we, we just uh, give you thanks for that. Father, we continue to pray for those who uh, have struggled. We think in particular of this church family. We want to remember Tyler Clark. And, uh, we pray that you will be with him and the treatments and, and for his body to respond in a favorable way. We pray for patience through all of that. We pray for uh, Brent and Glenda as they continue on with their daily challenges. And Father, may they uh, feel your presence and your nearness through all of that. Pray for Lori and her family and ask for uh, patience and encouragement and uh, just uh, your very near. Father, we pray for uh, Tammy and her surgery coming this week. And we ask that that will go well. And then following the surgery, we pray for healing. Pray for the search committee as they continue to work here with this congregation and as they continue to seek out your leading and your direction. And uh, we pray that you will guide them in all of their meetings and contacts and discussions and uh, that they will feel your presence through that. And Father, we pray tomorrow evening for the congregational meeting. And we pray that you will be with the time of election. Bless that as they elect new people to serve in various capacities. As they look at the past year and look ahead to the coming year, Father, we're, we're thankful again for your faithfulness. And uh, just trust you in the coming year that you will provide all that is needed each day. And Lord, we continue to pray for our nation, our leaders. hard not to, to get frustrated, and, uh, but you have told us in your word to pray for those who rule over you, and so Father, we, we pray for all of our leaders on the national level, level the state level, the local level, and uh, we pray that you will give them wisdom, help them to look to you and to seek your way in all that they do. Father, we pray for families again in our nation that have been heartbroken. We continue to see with uh, shootings and killings, and uh, we, we just shake our heads in disbelief. So, Father, we pray for those families, for those who have lost loved ones, for those who have been wounded. And we pray the same for those who are serving our country in the armed forces many that are away from home, stationed in various places around our world. We pray that you will keep them safe. And Father, we pray for your blessing upon them and their families. And now, Lord, as we look to you this morning, and as we consider one of your servants and her response, we pray that through that, we will be challenged in our own lives do our own soul searching of how we respond to you and uh, are we ready to say I am your servant Lord and, uh, so Father speak to us and uh, may your message encourage challenge us in each of our lives as well as we continue our worship Father we give our gifts and our offerings and we ask for your blessing upon those gifts this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Your morning offerings will be received.
to invite the children to come forward for our children's song. boys and girls. Yeah, we call it candles. You got that right. Do we have a special name for what this thing is and these candles? Anybody know? Candles, yeah. Huh? Well, nobody, nobody remember last year I talked with you kind of about it. Did you ever hear the word Advent? Advent? No? No, really? Well, this season of the year leading up to Christmas is called Advent. And this is called an Advent wreath. The church has one of these. Last year we didn't have it in a circle. I had it kind of spread out because I, I did something a little bit different. But this is called an Advent wreath. And you said there were candles. They're called Advent candles. And the reason we have four of these and then the center candle is because we have four weeks called Advent. Four Sundays that lead up to Christmas. Advent means preparing, getting ready. So, how do we get ready for Christmas? What are some things we do to get ready for Christmas? Decorate. Yeah, Christmas tree. We put up a Christmas tree, right? Did one in church here. We, we put decorations on our Christmas tree. Pardon? Wrap presents. Yeah. None of you like presents, do you? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Maybe part of Advent for you is kind of suggesting to mom and dad. Do you ever do that? Suggest to mom and dad. Say, boy, I'd sure like this. Uh, I remember, well, we don't, I, you guys wouldn't understand that. When I was your age, we used to have Christmas catalogs. Some people remember Christmas catalogs. Yeah. you got to be white here to remember a Christmas catalog, right? We'd get a Christmas catalog, and I grew up on a farm, and, you know, we didn't, really have a lot of things like a lot of kids did, and we, we weren't that well off, but, but we'd have this Christmas catalog, and I used to go through the Christmas catalog, and I'd see a neat truck, or I'd see something else, and so I'd circle in the Christmas catalog, hoping my mom and dad would see that. Sometimes they did. Most of the time they did. So, but I'm sure you have other ways that, that you suggest what you would like for Christmas. So that's a lot of stuff. So we're getting ready for Christmas and preparing, and we want to do that. Now, looking at this table I set up, that was part of my preparation. What do all these things look like? Angels. Angels, yeah. Have you ever seen an angel? I mean, a real angel? No, no. I don't know if I have either. But we, we have a lot of representations. And the reason I put all these up here, my wife kind of likes angels. And years ago, we bought a little tree. We call this our angel tree. And so we would collect little angel ornaments, or sometimes she'd get a little gift from somebody, and we'd hang it on our tree. But sometimes it got bigger than our tree, and so then we'd, we'd set them around. So these are some of the angels that we have our home. So we're going to talk about angels this year for Advent. Angels. Uh, what do they do? Oh, I can think. Anybody know what this is? A phone. What do we use a phone for? Calling people. Why 
Why do we call people? Tell them something. Exactly. Give them a message. So, we want to give a message to somebody. We, we do a phone call or we send a text or maybe we do an email on the computer in different ways. In fact, there are other ways, kind of old ways. You know what this is? What is it? A Christmas card. You get Christmas cards once in a while? In the mail or someplace? And you get, in fact, this is your church, this Christmas card. This was just laid on the table in the consistory room, and this is from Northwestern College. And it's just wishing this church, this congregation, it's a way of Merry Christmas. So it's a way of sending a message. You're wishing somebody a Merry Christmas. I've got something else here. Does anybody know what this is? A letter. We don't do letters very much anymore, do we? We always send a text or we send an email or something. This is a letter. It was written to me on January 27, 2012. Not seven years ago. This letter came from my mom. It was one of her last letters because about a month and a half later she passed away. Do you know that my mom, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit this morning, my mom and I wrote a letter every week to each other for over 45 years. Did you shake your head? No. Yeah. Really? We did. Now, I know people don't write letters, but my mother was a great letter writer, and you can see she wrote this when she was 94 years old. And the penmanship is perfect. She used to write sometimes five, six pages by hand. And every week we, we'd go to mailbox about Wednesday or Thursday because we knew there was going to be a letter from my mom. And I'd write her back and if I didn't, I'd get scolded because I forgot we wrote letters. But it was our way of sharing because you know what? My mom didn't have a cell phone. My mom never had a computer. But it was her way of sending a message, of telling me things. It was my way to tell her back. Well, I'm going to go way back to the old days. They didn't have cell phones. They didn't even have letters, for God's sake, not through a mail system. And so many times God used angels to bring a message. You could say angels were kind of like a cell phone, a computer, a, a, a letter writing, all of that stuff. God had a way of communicating. We're going to talk about that this morning. And actually, I couldn't be with you last Sunday, so we're a week behind. So we're going to let each of our candles stand for somebody that God sent an angel to with a special message. So last week, if I could have been with you, we were going to talk about how God used an angel, and that angel came to Zachariah. That's a big name. Say it with me. Zachariah. Zachariah was a priest, kind of like a pastor today. He, he was in charge of things where people came and worshiped. And he was getting older, and his wife's name was Elizabeth. Do you think you can remember that? Zachariah and Elizabeth. And they had wanted a child all their life, and they never could have a child. And so they thought they'd never have a child. And one day the angel came to Zechariah and he said, Your wife Elizabeth is going to have a baby. And you're going to call him John. And Zechariah said, Oh, I can't believe that. There's no way we can have a child. And because Zechariah didn't believe, you know what happened? He could not speak till the child was born. Can you imagine not speaking, not saying? And so they waited, and God fulfilled that promise. And that was what was going to lead to what Christmas is all about. So our first candle is going to be for the angel's message to who? Zechariah. Our second candle is going to be the angel's message to me. I think God just sent me a message. Whew. Maybe you're saying, all right, keep on going, let's go. You ever hear of Mary? Who is Mary? The mother of Jesus. But she was just a young girl. And one day an angel, now I don't know what that angel looked like, but one day an angel came to Mary and she said, you're going to have a baby. And his name is going to be Jesus. And he's going to be the Son of God. And 
So as we prepare for Christmas, we want to think about the angel's message. So, first candle, angel message to who? Zechariah. Second candle, angel message to Mary. Okay, so I need to draw a couple of names here. Aiden. Aiden? You want to light a candle? Okay, come on up here. Kelly. First candle is for who? Zachariah. Second candle. And who's our second candle? Mary. Next week we'll move on to number three, okay? Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you as we prepare to think about and to celebrate thankful for the angel's message that came to Zechariah, that came to Mary. And Father, we just pray that you would help us to trust and believe as you were asking them to do as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may return to your seats. numbered 128 it came upon a midnight clear we'll sing the first three verses of 128 you this morning to turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 1. Sharing a little bit with the children this morning about communication. And, uh, you know, it's really something when you stop and think about how 
location has changed over the years. As I mentioned, I, I grew up on a dairy farm in Wisconsin. We, we didn't get our first TV until I was in the eighth grade, and then we had those wonderful little black and white boxes, and you'd get the tinfoil out, remember? And then you move the antennas, and as you're moving it, you'd finally get a good picture, and you'd say to somebody who was moving, just stay there and hold it. Remember that? Yeah, try to adjust all that. And, uh, you know, I, I was thinking back about that, and I lived, I don't know about some of you, but I lived a pretty isolated life growing up on the farm in Wisconsin, uh, out in the country. Um, I don't remember. Once in a while we had the radio on in the barn and we'd hear uh, bits and pieces of the, the news, but seldom watch uh, the newscasts on TV. And uh, in many respects, uh, when I think back to my growing up, I I hardly knew what was going on in the world. And this week I thought, maybe I was a lot better off. Well, man, sometimes, you know, you watch the news, and after the news in the morning, you're like, okay, that was depressing. And, uh, and so in some ways that, I guess, was good. And uh, now, today, you know, with all of our means of communication and cell phones and texting and tweeting and all that kind of stuff. But I couldn't help but go back uh, when I was growing up. Um, aside from driving a truck for my uncle who had a lumber yard business and I made deliveries in the summertime, I would, I would haul loads to Chicago. Aside from those trips to delivering to Chicago, I was never out of the state of Wisconsin. My family went to family vacations. We had dairy cows at our milk. We had six kids, and uh, we pretty much stayed home. And I went to a local college called Lakeland College by Sheboygan. It's about 22 miles from home. I commuted my first two years of college, drove back and forth, continued to work for my uncle at the lumberyard driving truck. And, uh, and then I was told by the seminary, because I knew I wanted to go into the ministry, that I should have classes in Greek. And the school I was at didn't have Greek anymore. And uh, so I found out that Northwestern College had Greek. And so I got an application. I applied to Northwestern College to transfer over there. I, I got things sent over. They accepted my transcript. And I can still remember very end of August, uh, I took off on a certain date, and I loaded everything, and everything wasn't too much, but I loaded what I had in my 57 Ford. I got the map out, you know, those things, those maps, not GPS, no, 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 uh, you, you, you map out your route, and I can remember I, I left home, and I drove west to La Crosse, Wisconsin, and I got on Highway 16, the only part of I-90 was across Minnesota yet, and I, 16, if you ever took 16 out of La Crosse before I-90, it was all like this. I mean, oh my goodness, and, and I was all by myself, and I drove across uh, Minnesota, got to Worthington, and I, my map said Highway 60, I turned on Highway 60 South. I headed to Highway 60, and I came into Orange City. I had never seen Orange City. I would never seen Northwest Iowa. I would never seen the college. So I drove into Orange City, and I remember getting to that corner there, you know, where the gas stations are in the college, and, and I drove real slow, and, well, here's this building, Cullen Brander Hall, and my paper said I'm on the second floor, Cullen Brander Hall, so I, I found Cullen Brander Hall. I found my room. I... I moved in. I met my roommate. That was a disaster. That's another whole story. I'm thankful he was my roommate only for a week and a half, or I would have been home in Wisconsin. Um, like I said, that's another whole story. He was a transfer student from Rhode Island. I don't know what in the heck he was doing in Iowa. He doesn't know what in the heck he was doing in Iowa. I don't know what he ever happened to. But anyway, um, so I moved in. 
And I think back to it now. You know, I drove all alone, had never been through Minnesota, had never been to Northwest Iowa, had never seen Northwestern College. And we didn't have phones. I mean, there was a pay phone, one phone on the whole second floor of Cullen Brander Hall there. But that cost money. And I didn't have a lot of money. And so I remember back that now. My folks never knew whether I made it to college or not. Not till I wrote a letter and put it in the mail, and, and they finally got the letter, and I told them about how my trip went. But what a different day and age we live in, isn't it? We, we just kind of trusted and believed. I, I guess my folks figured no phone call was, I guess, a no news, good news. So I guess he made it. I guess he... He found his place he's going to live. And, uh, and then began something that I started to share with the children. I've only got a, a few of them here. This is just a, a notebook, a few of my le mom's letters that I saved in later years. But in 1967, my mother started writing me a letter every week. Unless we were coming home for some vacation, she wrote a letter, like I shared with the children. And I wrote a letter back to her, and like I alluded to in my children's time, if I didn't write a letter back, then her letter next week would say, So aren't you feeling well, Raj? What's wrong? I knew what that meant. I expect a letter. She wrote a letter, and after... after Three, two years of college, my wife and I got married. We went to Western Theological Seminary. After three years of seminary, we took our first congregation in Brandon, Wisconsin, and then later on Rock Valley, and then back to Wisconsin, and then later on Alton Sioux Center, and so forth. In all that time, my mother wrote a letter every week for 45 years. And that became so precious to us. In fact, even when our children were teenagers, they'd come home from school and they'd say, did we get a letter from Grandma today? And they'd have to read the letter. Now, there was nothing that astounding in the letter. I found out when she did the wash. I found out what she baked that day. Uh, just everyday stuff. But we shared. And she would also share in those letters about things she was facing, and tough things, and, you know, and good things and stuff, but what what a process it was, and, and we're talking about, about angels here, and in many ways, if I may say this, my mother was an angel. She really was. My mother's mother died when my mother was eight years old, and she had two brothers and a dad, my grandpa. Grandpa Wallace, who is not the kindest man. He was kind of a grouchy guy. But my mother started taking care of their house, the two brothers and her dad, when she was nine years old. And she did it for the rest of her life. She never left that house until she was 80-some years old. She came home as a baby, and she stayed in that house. And so, in many ways... I think of my mother as an angel. But I was thinking about that, and I was reflecting on all of that because of what we want to look at this morning in our Scripture. So if you've got your Bibles open to Luke chapter 1, look at verse 26. In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David, the virgin's name was Mary. It's the first time we meet Mary. Why Mary? We don't know. There was nothing that special about Mary. There was nothing that special about Nazareth. But God chose a young girl in Nazareth, who was pledged to be married, and, and pledged, some translations say, betrothed. It, it was a, a, usually a, a, a period of about a year long where parents kind of agreed on the marriage of their children. And 
there would be this pledge time, this betrothal time. And, and during that time, usually the husband-to-be would be getting a house ready and so that when they came together in marriage, they would have a place to live. So picture this, Mary, she's pledged to be married to this man. Now, by the way, and I'm sure you've heard this before, most commentators feel Mary would have been about 14 or 15 years old. Think about that. Maybe some of you have children about 14 or 15, or maybe some of you have grandchildren 14 or 15. You're going to be the mother of Jesus Christ. What a what what an incredible thing that is! And so the angel came, and if you look at verse twenty-eight, the angel went to her and said, "Greetings, you are highly favored. The Lord is with you." Verse twenty-nine. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. No kidding. Can you imagine when that angel came to Mary, who might have been 15 years of age, and says, greetings, you are highly favored. What does that mean? We have no exact we, we have no idea exactly how this meeting between Mary and the angel took place. There, there's various speculations. I'm sure you've seen some of the things in, in movies or stories you've watched about Jesus, Mother Mary, and Joseph and all of that. But think about what might have happened. Sumon Kidd writes the following in a devotional book. She writes, and I quote, she's imagining Mary's response. I remember as though it were yesterday. I had come with my water skins to the spring, hurrying ahead of the sinking sun. I, a peasant girl, going about the regularities of my life at that time, the same spring, the same chore, the same routine. But somehow that day found me fully heightened with awareness, alive to God and the world and I was like a child full of wonder and expectation. The spring was deserted. I stood there alone for a moment, alert to the presence of God in the rippling of the water. I dipped my water skin into the stream. Mary, the voice broke the silence. I looked up. No one was there. There was a Mary, the voice poured forth from that shaft of light. I, I froze my hands still in the cool waters of the spring, holding my water skin. And slowly I, I lifted my eyes. He stood only a few feet away, surrounded by light. Don't be afraid, Mary. I, I'm from God, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you can call him name Jesus. How can that be? I whispered. I, I'm a virgin. The Holy Spirit will, will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. The child to be born will be called Holy. Yet even now, as I sit by the spring, I, I feel the wonder of that time. And think of how strange it is that, that God breaks through in the small, common moments. How strange it is that even the ordinary moment of existence... If on that day my eyes and ears had been closed, if my sense of awe and expectancy had been asleep, if my sensitivity to God had been dimmed, would I have heard the angel's voice? 
And even long ago, I think of, of Moses and the burning bush. So writes King Montfort. The message came to Mary, and the angel said, You are highly favored. The Lord is with you. And the natural question is, is why? Why Mary? Why did God choose this one to bear his son? And we don't really know. But I ponder the words. The angel said to Mary, you are highly favored. And suddenly the thought strikes me. The very fact that you're here this morning is part of an answer to that question. I mean, why are you here this morning? Are you here because of something you've done? Are you here this morning because you somehow deserve this? <laughs> Let me put it another way. Do you know the real meaning? What is Christmas for you? It could be about presents and Santa Claus and reindeer and elves and beautiful decorations. It could be all about fairy tale stuff, dancing snowmen, flying reindeers, all of the stuff we've added. That could be Christmas because that is Christmas for many people. Somehow, through your parents, your grandparents, your church, through who knows what, somehow you have come to understand that, and by God's Spirit, have understood what that means. And, and if so, you're highly favored. There was a song some years back. I, I'm, I'm sure many of you will remember this. The words went like this. Why me, Lord? What have I ever done? To deserve even one of the pleasures I've known. Tell me, Lord, what did I ever do that was worth loving you for the kindness you showed? When you think about it, you and I are highly favored. And so going back to Mary and the visit from the angel, look at verse 30. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will be, child, will, will be with child, give birth to a son. You are to give him the name Jesus. And Mary says, Well, how can this be? Because I'm a virgin. And the angel says, The Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God, for nothing is impossible with God. And as I ponder all of that, I stand... I mentioned last year, as I shared at Advent, about a, a, a book, Two from Galilee, by Marjorie Holmes. And again, this week I pulled it off my shelf. Every year I go back and I, I read as Marjorie Holmes pictures Mary and receiving this message and all of her thoughts. And again, I go back to Sue Monk Kidd. I shared what, what she wrote a moment ago. Let me go back to Sue Monk Kidd again. Imagining things from Mary's perspective, she writes the following. The stigma follows me like a shadow in Nazareth streets. And although I fight them, the tears sting my eyes. For even now, after all these months, the women whisper when I pass. The scandal is thick with gossip. There goes 
she sinned before her wedding. And now she blasphemes God by claiming that her child is conceived by the Holy Spirit. Does she think we're really mad enough to believe that? I glance at the whispering women. Their eyes stare at me with raw accusation. Oh, dear Jesus, at least you believe me. I think as I hurry into the courtyard of our house, I, I drop my market basket with sudden weariness. The long months of rejection and hurt wash over me in great black waves. Oh God, what have you asked of me? Unquote, O oh right, see my tears. And so many other things that happened. The, the journey to Bethlehem. What a, what a difficult journey to her condition, on foot or on a donkey. And then in Bethlehem, and there, there's no room for them, and they end up in a, in a stable with animals away from friends. And the angel had said, your highly favored must not have seen highly favored. So for you and I today, sometimes the road we are called to travel is not an easy road. Sometimes it's a tough road. Many times there are tears and heartaches and burdens. And, and many times we, we wonder, why, Lord, why are you letting this happen? Why are you letting that happen? Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have favored us in such a special way that we come here this morning and the story that we are talking about in many senses is so familiar that we don't even stop and think of what it means that we know the real meaning. Christmas, that we know that Christmas is not about snowmen and reindeer and presents and trees and lights, but it's about a child that was born. And when we think about that and we think about Mary and what you asked of her, may it be an encouragement to us. May we also respond like Mary and those times when we have all kinds of questions and those times when we can't understand and those times when we begin to wonder and doubt in those times, Father. Help us to have the faith of Mary and to say, but I'm the Lord's servant and I know who is with me. Help us to trust you. In Jesus' name we pray. Him is 371, Have Thine Own Way. We'll stand and sing the first one and three, and then we'll have the benediction and sing the last verse. 371. Mm -hmm. 